Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. What's different about this week, Rob? I hear you say, well, it's not an actor, it's not a comedian. It's a singer and a songwriter and a damn fine one too, who I've known for a fair while now. When he talks on stage, he's pretty funny, which is, which is a bit annoying. He is the driving force of the Stereophonics. He is, of course, Kelly Jones. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. I am in the studio. I've just been signing 5,000 cards for the pre-order of the live album oh. on decorating tables. So is this like a blessed relief? Is this a nice sort of uh, it is. break? Well, so how are you? I'm all right, actually. I've been coming to the studio one day a week, just doing some stuff. And the rest of the time, just trying to keep the kids focused going to school and doing all that kind of stuff, really. And we had a baby in, in lockdown as well. So we had, a, we, had a, we had a baby in May. Riley was great for the, about the first four weeks. In the last two weeks, uh, she started to really need to get rid of some energy. So the house started to become basically a construction site. Do you remember where we first met? I remember meeting you in Bailey's Hotel. It might have been after Jules Holland. It was, I knew Stuart, right? Lovely yeah. Stuart Cable. I, how I got to know him, I think I'd been on it. He'd had, he had a TV show. I think yeah. I'd been a guest on it and I would maybe run into him. So I got to know him. He said, would you want to come along to a rehearsal? That was a music, music bank, was it? So I said, yeah, great. So I come along to this rehearsal as Stuart's friend. And then we go to a hotel and that's when I first met you. And my first impression of you was of a very, very intense young man. Was it? Yeah. I keep hearing that, actually. Oh, yeah. I, I, came, I came away kind of going, ooh, ooh. And, and do you remember what we talked about? I can, I can see you by this window. I can see the, uh, the, the actual um, event. Not out the window. You were actually inside the window. <laughs> you were um, very good like that, weren't you? You did allow me to come in, into the bar of the hotel, and have a drink yeah. on the inside, which is good of you. <laughs> Could have took it outside you. It's it's interesting because it ties in with with your documentary that that I I want to talk about. Is it Tom? No, it wasn't Tom. <laughs> Although we will undoubtedly come on to Tom. I mean, that's just a given, isn't it? Um, no, it was voices and throats and things because I'd had a oh, bit of, a bit of a thing where I felt like I had I, I like a pee in in my throat. Ah, oh, yes, Globus. I remember talking to you about that. And you get you reassured me. I do, yeah. It's like a muscle spasm thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I'd had that, and I was really worried about it. And the thing that ties it in, because with, with your documentary, okay, Don't Let the Devil Take Another Day, which I want people to watch because yeah. that bit in the middle of it, I mean, all the singing and everything, obviously the performances, as you'd expect, are wonderful. But you yeah. start off by saying, you say, in 2019, I, I, I did so <laughs> I was going to go out to the band, or whatever. and you say essentially, but I had a secret. I hadn't yeah. told anyone. And I, I sat up. I went, what the hell is this? What, I, I thought, is he going to come out? What's he going to do? I, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and then the next well, thing, you're sat in a hospital. I'll start with your first point first, which was the intense bit. Um, <laughs> I've been thinking about it a lot myself, actually, because the documentary shows the version of me that I know, if you know what I mean. I'm telling stories on stage and I'm, 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 I'm kind of feeling comfortable on stage being myself. I think from about 97, 98, 99, there was a period of time through there where you, I went from a boy working in the market and being in film school to then being on the front of the paper and then people loving it or not liking it or whatever. And, and a guard slowly began to come up and the armour slowly began to come on and the trust slowly began to diminish with people. Yeah. So every time I was meeting people, I didn't know it at the time. I only know it now because I'm wise and old. <laughs> there was uh, an insecurity in letting myself be myself a little bit, I think. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's quite interesting because I've been, I've been looking a bit at that. Because when I watched the film, I was thinking, oh, that actually does look like me. But, and then because the guy who was even doing the sound editing was going, when he sees the stereophonics footage and he's all the people and he's all you know, the, the glasses and the, and, and the energy and the anger and all that kind of stuff on the stage. He's like, I don't know that guy, but I can recognise the other guy because he's sitting on the couch behind me now. Yeah. 
the documentary regarding uh, the hospital bit and all that, I probably shouldn't do too many spoilers, I suppose. I don't really know how that stuff works, and I've done one before. You had a polyp on your yeah. vocal cord. And the incredible thing is we see you, we see that we see the endoscope or whatever it is in, in your yeah. throat, right? And we see the surgeon and we see the voice coach you have afterwards. And we see you at home, presumably filming all this on your phone, trying to get your voice back. And, it, yeah. and it's some of the tensest. Claire and I watched it yesterday afternoon on, on, on the sofa. And yeah. she, she said, oh, my God, this is so tense. Yeah, and you're it, trying to hit notes. And the great thing is, a lot of the songs you're doing are stereophonic songs, so they're songs we know and we've heard you do, and you can't get to the notes. It's quite a strange thing to go through um, silence. First of all, you're not allowed to talk. Then you're allowed to talk for two minutes a day. Wow. And five minutes a day. Yeah. And I was down in Wales, and I was kind of wandering around this house. The silence is quite weird. Silence being on your own is fine, but when you actually can't speak as well, yeah. it's kind of a, an odd experience. So. And don't you say in, in the film that, that your mum's reaction to it was to speak louder? Yeah, she, yeah, she, was, she was just started shouting at me, yeah, yeah. What do you want for dinner? <laughs> what? But yeah, Tom was lovely. I thought I phoned Tom and he goes, uh, what was it like he said to me? He said, well, you know what happened with Julie Andrews? He said, um, they used a laser on her. He said, so whatever you do, he said, make sure they use a fucking knife. <laughs> Because when you use a laser, the skin shrinks back slightly after the heat. I always find it funny when Tom mentions a contemporary of his that wasn't quite in his world. So, you know, so Julie Andrews. So hearing yeah. him say the name Julie yeah. Andrews has great value for me. Yeah. And I was talking so we... to, to Julie Andrews, you know. <laughs> I know. But he was amazing. I would call him up and I would tell him all the ailments I was having. He goes, well, I've had that. I've had that too. I've had that. Yeah, yeah, you've got right. I've had that. That must have been really reassuring, though. It was great, actually. It was lovely. I think you said in the documentary, your voice has been the thing that's defined you. It's the thing that has take, given you your life. So to think yeah. that that is going to be not taken away from you, because you'll still have a voice, but it will have been broken. And it becomes quite psychological, really, because you know there was a bit of time where Joshua was coming here, and he made me put this, he made me put my tongue out and, like, like rest up, like, do this. And just balance a straw like this. Yeah. So then I wouldn't think about the words. And then he said, right, go in the mirror now. He said, and just hit the note you're trying to hit. And I hit it like a piece of piss. Right. But as soon as I put the words back in, all the tension and everything, and because it was the song was attached to it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the psychology behind this. So yeah. a lot of it was uh, training your brain, really. So, look, so, so, so we met then. I, I can't date that. I'm not sure when, when that was. I think it was about 99, wasn't it? I think it was the second album. Oh, no, no. It was later than that. It was later than that. I, don't, I would say the early to mid-2000s. And I didn't think we'd end up having the friendship that we now have. Because over the years then, we, we lost Stuart. And I've seen a, a fair bit of you at, at different things over the years. We've become good friends. I would never have said that after that first meeting. I did an interview with the Daily Mirror the other day, and he goes, I liked you a lot more after I watched that film. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't. I didn't dislike you, but but I but I but I sensed that I sensed that you weren't that you weren't that you weren't letting me in, which is which is kind of what, yeah. what you said, you know. It is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I remember reading somebody's first biography of the band. It was written by a guy that used to work on Newsbeat, you know. And the first guy I met in V2 Records, one of the directors, he said, I just met Kelly Jones. He's a very intense young man. <laughs> and I thought, I actually didn't know what intense meant. <laughs> um, so it's coming up a lot. Yeah. The past. But since then, I would say these days, I would say still driven, but a little more mellow. Yeah. Let's talk more about Tom. What have you learned from him, apart, apart from the throat stuff that he was very helpful for? But when you did Mama Told Me Not To Come, you did a lot of, you, you shot the video, well, you recorded it in Britain, you shot the video yeah. in Las Vegas, and then you promoted it in, in various territories. What yeah. did you learn from him spending that time with him? The first time I, I met him was in a pub in Harrow Road, I think. I just remember him telling me and Stuart stories for about three and a half hours. Yeah. I couldn't believe the storytelling ability, really, from Morecambe and Wise right the way up to Frank Sinatra. We were just throwing names at him, and he had an anecdote for every single name we threw at him. He's and got just an thought... amazing ability to tell a story that he's told yes. many times, 
as if it's the first time. Like a stand-up comedian. I love Elvis, so I've always, whenever I see him, I yeah. ask him something about Elvis. And I, when we did the uh, video for um, uh, Islands in the Stream, again in Las Vegas, mm. how strange, we both filmed videos with him in Las Vegas. What are the chances yeah. of that? I know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're in the back of a car and I said, do you have any stories about Elvis that you don't tell in public? And he went, oh, oh yeah. yeah. I was in the shower after the show and I said, oh, I, so yeah. Yeah. I, I said, oh, I've heard this one, right? And he said, you haven't heard the ending. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me, he told me the story and there was an ending I hadn't heard. I have since heard him tell that ending in public. But, but at that point, there was a little, there was a bit at the end that was a little extra, but it's just a... Uh, director's cut. A, it's just a, just a delight. But did you sort of, when you, you would go around with him and you'd be doing promo on different shows, were you watching him and like picking things up or... I used to love the way he would do, you know, the Chills and Fever and those kinds of vocals, you know. Uh, doing the actual vocal with him it was kind of, well, I was only, what was I, 22, 23 maybe? And I guess at the time I was young enough, just have enough confidence to stand in a room with somebody like that without worrying about it too much. Doing it now, I'd probably be completely different. Yeah. Um, but we sang it two or three times and we went back in the control room and he, he looked at the engineer and he said, yeah, you know, take the reverb off a bit and take the compressor down a bit. He said, uh, he said it sounds good. He said, you want Chinese? <laughs> and the next thing I knew, we were in Baker Street having a Chinese uh, meal. I used to sit next to him in dinners all the time, like in Vegas, and he would he would break the uh, the shells of the prawns and stuff and put them on my plate. And he go, you have that? He said, yeah, you can eat. He said, and there's nothing on you. He said, you don't stop eating. And he just kept giving me his food. <laughs> what I, I used to love watching him. You know when you get off a plane and you have to get those little buses into the airport? It, I was fascinated just watching him standing on one of those buses holding on the thing with his bag. I just thought that's something I didn't think I'd ever see in my life, you know. We did this uh, Comet Relief record, uh, Islands in the Stream, and we did a little bit of promotion for it then. He flew over for that, so we did a few things. And then we had a dinner one night, and uh, Thomas sat there, big circular table, and my wife was sat on one side of him, and Ruth Jones. And I always remember, he ordered oysters to start, but he had 12 of them. Really? I mean, you wouldn't order 12 oysters, would you? <laughs> no. I wouldn't order 12. I might have six and maybe not have the sixth. So he gets he gets this big, massive thing of 12 voices, and he looked like a silverback gorilla, you know, like the, the <laughs> head of the whoop or the flange. And you know they give you the, the, um, the lemon, and it's in a kind of muslin cloth, and you can squeeze yeah, the lemon. Yeah. Well, the way he squeezed that lemon, he, he went, he went, <sighs> and I just, sat, <laughs> I just sat there going, bloody hell. I'd done his, um, uh, in the Grosvenor Hotel, I had to sing for him when they did Man of the Year for him. And that was quite surreal, because I'd be looking out at him, and Mark would give me a few of the songs he used to play as a kid. And, because um, I didn't know he played the guitar, Tom. Right, yeah. yeah. And, um, but he was sat there, you know, you had Tim Burton there, Helen Bonner Carter. So it was quite strange looking out at them a lot. And then when we went back to the, to the hotel that night, he was, he was sitting in the room, and he was playing all these old songs, all these old Elvis songs on the guitar. Really? And, and singing. Yeah, it was amazing. And then we brought him on when we had that Reading Festival. Yeah. Because he never really played to festivals before. Right. That was great, because when he walked on in Reading, in Yonkorn, and we started, I mean, the crowd went ballistic, and they just all started jumping up and down. It was like a sea of kids doing this. Yeah, yeah. And you could see his face. He was amazing, you know. Did he love it? Yeah, he loved it. It was a great idea, actually. So he, he did some good stuff, man. Let's talk about... Uh, a couple of times that uh, people won't know this, that, that you and I have performed together. <laughs> Your wedding, you, you had a lovely wedding over in Ireland. Claire and I came, and I think I made a, a, a little speech at the reception, didn't I? Yeah. Right, I did that. And then you, you yeah. ha had the band, so you got, you got the phonics there with you, obviously. And yeah. you also had Ronnie Wood and Paul Weller. I did, yeah. <laughs> And you were the Tom Jones because Tom couldn't make it. Tom couldn't make it. So, so you with that lineup did some songs, right? And and we're in a yeah. beautiful marquee, but it's it's a wedding reception, you know. And you got all the guys up there. Well, this is great. And then you called me up, so because it was a little stage, so Paul Weller has to leave the stage to make <laughs> way for me. 
And then we do the song and it's great fun. And, and I look across when you're in the guitar. So, and there's Ronnie bloody Wood playing. And then we do it. And then as I go off the stage for Paul Weller to come back on, as I go off, he says to me, he looks at me, he goes, he goes, you haven't lost it, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you talk about surreal moments. I, I just thought, Oh, oh mate, that was surreal for me just looking around it. When I saw the, the pictures of that thing, it's just ridiculous because you know, as a kid, the jam and, and obviously the Rolling Stones and the faces, for them to be in my wedding. I always remember the story, everybody was saying that when they, everybody got off the plane that day and there's a car hire place outside and the guy was wondering what the fuck was going on because they, <laughs> Ronnie Wood walked in, then Paul Weller walked in and he's like, what's going on here? The next time we did was at my 50th and for my 50th, you gave me this present. Now, Paul Weller's not in this picture because <laughs> he'd had to get off the stage. Can you see that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's not there, though, is he? But look at that. There's Ronnie Wood, for That's God's great, sake. Yeah. So you gave me that for my 50th. Yeah. And then you very kindly got up. We had a band, and you got up, and, and you and I, we did. <laughs> Mama told me get, not to come we, again. You didn't get off. Right? Of course not, <laughs> no. And then you started doing Dakota. And, and yeah. people were like, oh, my God, it was fantastic. Great party, wasn't it? It was yeah. just one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing I wanted to, to talk to you about. It was really interesting. Again, in the documentary, you talk about how you write a song and then you record the song and that's mm -hmm. the song. And you haven't yeah. done it that much at that point. And then that yeah. song is then with you, if, if it's a, one of the ones that people love for the rest of your life. Are you saying you would have liked a bit more time with that song before you made that definitive version? Probably not in many ways, because the spontaneity, it's interesting to sing a song the minute you write the lyrics, because I think you believe the words more. That's interesting. You probably believe them more than you ever will again, because you're literally going through that experience. See, that, that ties in with, with a, a c comedian, because when you yeah. do a stand-up tour, at the beginning of the tour, you're enjoying it on a different level because you're also yeah. discovering it. There's your experience of it and their experience yeah. of it. And they can be such wildly different things. I, I, I'm sure it's the same for you. I've come off, every time I've come off stage, I thought that is the best gig I've ever done. People come in the dressing room and they don't say nothing. <laughs> and then once the we all come off and go, what was that, man? The sound was crap, the bass was good. They come off and they, and, and they all come in just go, and that was a, one of the best gigs I've ever seen you play. Yeah. I was, I was, did a run in the West End of a stand-up show years ago. And I was doing a Saturday night show. And I came off at the end thinking, oh, that was rubbish. And my tour manager said to me, Billy Connolly was in. And I Billy Connolly was in there? Yeah. And I thought, oh, no, he saw that performance. Oh, that was awful. <laughs> but then I've seen him since. And he was seemingly sincerely nice about it. Did I tell you my Billy Connolly story? No, go on. So when we were all in LA, round up at the same time, I met you, I guess. Uh, I, I remember checking into the Mondrian Hotel on, on the Strip in LA, all white. You know what Reese, Reese Ivan says about that hotel? Everything's white, white furniture, white walls. It's like being <laughs> in an asylum. Yeah. And then he follows it up, he goes, I wake up in the morning and think they took one of my fucking organs. Yes, 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 that's right, yeah. Uh, well, I went there and I had a letter on the reception from Reese. I'd never met him. Oh. We were massive Twin Town fans and all that, but he said in the letter, I've heard you in town, I'm filming uh, Little Nicky with um, Arby Keitel and... Uh, Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler. He said, I'm, I'm filming nights, so if I get a night off, it'd be great to meet up. And I sat down in the bar downstairs with Tony, you know, Tony plays the key, yeah. and the door kicked open, and he went, enter the fucking dragon, he said, I got the night off. <laughs> so we went out. And I said, Travis are playing in the, in the Troubadour. He said, all right, come on, then let's go. And I, I, we got off the stairs and we literally walked to the bar and Billy Connolly was standing at the bar. So I'd love Billy Connolly. So we stood with Billy and then he was giving me his number and stuff. He said, give me a ring the next time you're in town. So the next time I got to LA, his wife must have answered. I always remember his wife going off and going, Billy, you've got a call. And he goes, who is it? She said, Kelly Jones. He goes, who? She goes, Kelly Jones. He goes, who? He goes, Kelly Jones, you know, and he comes on the phone. He goes, hello? He said, Billy, it's Kelly. He said, from Stereo Forest, we met about a year ago. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, he said. I said, do you want to come out of the show? He goes, oh, I wish I could. He said, I've got to go and get a fucking Judy Denshin Award. <laughs> <laughs> go back to the sign-in now. Right, make it out to Rob and Claire, please. <laughs> I will. 
Love to the family. Oh, Cal, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you, Rob. It's been lovely to see you. Thanks so see much. Soon. Bye bye.